Hello and welcome to March. It's International Women's History Month here at Community Ag and all of, to be fair, we don't have um, a monopoly on International Women's History Month. And I really relate to women's history because obviously I am a woman with a vast history, being almost 50 as I am. The new 50 is a thing, I don't know whether you know, it's um, according to uh, magazine editor Emma Soames, 50 is the new 34. There's even a name for it, Quintastic. Of course, it doesn't refer to any old being 50. No, 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 no. Only to the glamorous and the gorgeous. So people like Nigella Lawson, Bonner, Colin Firth, Jayla, so what about the rest of us? Well, it's a less hurtful situation for us, according to philosopher Alan de Botton. He reckons that by the time you're 50, you're definitely in the suburbs of mortality. And if you're a woman, the situation is even less quintastic, because typically women of this age may be transitioning towards menopause, which is a natural transition, um, that brings with it up to 48 different symptoms. Of course, we all experience those symptoms in different degrees, but they're often confusing and difficult to navigate and unexpected, and they can bring serious emotional, mental and physical side effects, which can last up to 12 years. And they can cause women to feel invisible and worthless. I think it's probably as a result of this that suicide data in the UK shows among women those aged 50 to 54 are the most likely to unalive themselves. So if you know me personally, you will know that growing older for me has been difficult. I definitely relate to feeling invisible. I mean, sometimes that's a good thing, if I'm honest, when I see that old lady that slightly overweight old lady in the shop window wearing ridiculously loud clothes. I think, who is that? So maybe it would be better to be invisible because then when I realise it's me, it's a very disappointing <laughs> turn of events. But really it's not the wrinkles or the middle-aged spread which have been most painful to deal with. It's been the changes in my hormones which have caused untold trauma to my body, but most particularly to my mind. This trauma has caused hurt to others, has alienated me in the process and to the extent that when I've thought about God during this situation, I've just found it almost impossible to believe that there is a God, uh, and if there is a God, that he's with me. I felt like God was a figment of the imagination, to be honest. Because I went from being this really bubbly person with a community, uh, good friends, a job that I loved, and a vocation I was really excited to be following, to suddenly crying alone in the back room of my house. I believe that everyone was against me. I was isolated from even my family. Um, it was a really, really hard situation. And I'm not telling you this to make you feel sorry for me um, or even to impress you with my transparency and honesty. Uh, it's just how it was. And when it was that way, I did wonder where the heck Jesus was in all of it and even if he was there what he would make of me this menopausal woman on the verge of psychosis who caused upset and drama would he judge me for that would he would he see me as a sinner or, or would he have compassion on me it it was really 
my relationship with Jesus was, was really difficult at that time. I think it can be quite hard to relate to the Bible as a woman because it's a vast piece of literature, isn't it? But actually, women feature relatively infrequently around 1.5% of the words spoken in the Bible are said by women. That's hardly anything, is it? And even among those who do make the cut, you look at them and you think, what relevance have they to me? I mean, with thousands of years of social change and oceans of vast cultural difference between us. Of course, the Bible uh, says in Ecclesiastes 1, that there is nothing new under the sun and i do think that's true i think um like research has has kind of proven that there are behavioral and um psychological universals that all people exhibit but even if that wasn't true there is one one woman in the biblical text who really, really speaks to me and I really relate to for obvious reasons, as you will see. She is the first woman to speak in the New Testament and in early Christian art is among the most popular portrayals. There's 38 um, surviving images and artefacts uh, that portray her she appears only briefly in jesus's story and she's unnamed but she's so significant that she appears in matthew mark and luke all of the synoptic gospels when we meet her she's in a really bad way she's been suffering from continual bleeding um, and we assume that that's vaginal bleeding for 12 years. And she's now utterly poverty stricken, having spent all her money on doctors who were unable to cure her. I suspect that she'd been taken advantage of rather a lot in that way. She's utterly, utterly hopeless. Even if we look at her situation from a 21st century perspective, with sanitary products and hot water bottles and paracetamol, you would have to admit that being on a 12-year period doesn't sound like much fun. So can you imagine that scenario lived out in a first century Palestine context? Even worse than the thought of having to continually wash bloody rags with no automatic laundry facilities. There was the issue of purity. So in researching menstruation in the New Testament, because I know how to live, I discovered that this woman would have been ritualistically unclean under Jewish purity laws. And that normally after a woman had finished her period, um, she would have a special cleansing bath, a mikvah, a purity bath. Uh, and then she would be restored to her community and to ritual purity. But this woman had no cessation in her monthly flow. And because of that, she was prohibited from touching others, cooking for them, going into the woman's court of the temple, having sex with her husband. People couldn't even sit where she had sat. We can only imagine the outworking of these laws in this woman's life. Without being able to go to the temple, how did she practice her religion? How did she get atonement from her sins in a culture that required sacrifice in the temple for atonement of sins? Without being able to touch others, was she able to have any social kind of relationship? In a culture where women's well-being was dependent upon being cared for by her father or her husband, had she been able to marry? In a culture where a woman's value was dependent on her ability to produce children, preferably a male heir, was she able to conceive? There are just so many questions out there. But for her, there were no questions. She had absolute faith that this man could heal her. So much so that she left the safety of her home alone 
and took a tired, pained, chronically ill body into the midst of a seething crowd. So much so that she risked the wrath of that crowd should they realise that she compromised their purity too by her presence. And so much so that in surreptitiously reaching for the hem of Jesus' garment, she risked making this miracle man himself unclean. So much so that she interrupted the man's mission to heal a prominent Pharisee's young daughter. I mean, she violates social codes and religious law, all to claim healing for herself without permission from anyone, without even the consent of Jesus. She's got so much to lose by this audacious act. But then maybe, maybe she felt like she'd lost en everything anyway. Maybe this radical act of faith was actually a last ditch act of desperation. I don't know about you, but I absolutely 100% relate to that kind of desperation. So the last few years for me, struggling with this hormonal mental illness, it was absolute anguish. There were times when I felt like I couldn't go on. I would have done absolutely anything to be well. And as I tell you this next part of the biblical text, I want you to know that I'm not saying that Jesus heals all diseases. Um, I, for one, needed medical intervention to help with my issues. But... Having said that, what happens next in the story provides us with absolute assurance that despite the hopelessness of any situation we might be in, despite our desperation, despite our ill-conceived attempts to fix ourselves, there is hope for us in this miracle man. Because all of the waste of years, the waste of potential and the waste of money, all of the laws and codes she's transgressed, all of her uncleanliness and unsuitability for respectable company, all of this is nothing, nothing to Jesus. And even despite the fact that she saw restoration in such an underhand, even quite cheeky, I would say, manner, she's healed immediately as she touches Jesus' clothes. But healing is only the physical aspect of what happens in this story. So one Christian commentator talks about the fact that with Jesus, healing is never just physical. And he says that the verb used to heal in this passage is sazine in the Greek, which connotes healing, yeah, but it also can mean salvation. And this woman is not only healed, but saved. I mean, I don't expect she felt like it at the time, but when Jesus stopped his disciples and refused to move on, unless the person who had appropriated his power stepped forward, he added another layer of restoration to her physical healing. By publicly proclaiming her healing and calling her daughter, he verifies her purity and restores her to community. Finally, I think there's also another way that Jesus affirms a woman, and that is through time and priority. When Jairus urges, his on, urges him onwards towards his sick daughter, he will not be dissuaded from stopping to interact with her. And it's notable, I think, at this point, that as a synagogue leader, Jairus would have been one of the people who enforced the purity laws preventing this woman with an issue of blood from attending worship and here he is again trying to keep her from Jesus but Jesus stands between the woman and the synagogue leader he refuses to allow her to be kept from him he's instituting a new way no one will now be separated from God because of impurity no one will be unworthy Jesus makes a way for everyone to be close to God. 
there are a thousand different ways we can find ourselves separated from God. Some of them are self-imposed. We might feel that we're too sinful, too broken, that our lives are too messy. Some of them might have been imposed on us by others. Perhaps they've told us we're not good enough, not spiritual enough, not respectable enough. Whatever the reason, we feel separated from God. There is good news for us in the story of the woman with the issue of blood because she shows us that nothing, nothing can separate us from his love. This is also what I found to be true in my own story because life here and now in the 21st century can also bear the good news of the gospel. When my work, personal life and ministry all broke down because of this mental illness I was suffering, I felt utterly abandoned by God. I honestly could not see how he was with me or, or how things could ever be restored. And the truth is they haven't, they haven't all been restored. God hasn't fixed everything. But as I reached out to him, he has been with me every step of the way. As I've navigated the maze of women's health care, cried through therapy sessions, fought to restore my marriage and struggled to adjust to new employment, he has given me a future and a hope. Okay, so I don't exactly know what the future looks like yet, but like the woman with the issue of blood, I am healed and lifted up and he loves me and has set my feet on a good path. Through his spirit, he will never leave me. These stories, mine and hers, might seem really specific to us and you might be wondering what they've got to do with you. You're not menopausal. You don't have any gynecological issues. Heck, you don't even menstruate. But situated as these stories are within the particular experiences of women, the truths that they convey are universal. Because irrespective of ancient purity laws and whether we menstruate or not, we are all unclean. The lustful glances, the harsh words, the mean-spirited thoughts. All of these are unclean behaviours that issue from within us. And we can't fix them by ourselves. We try to, we try to scrub them away, but the truth is that we can't. No amount of mantras or affirmations, oh, I don't know, none of it, none of it can do that but he can because he took all those things upon himself on the cross and he didn't just take them to death leaving a vacuum in their place he rose from the dead so that we could have new life and when he ascended to heaven he didn't leave us alone he left us his spirit to help us live out that new life so that we too can touch the hem of his garment and receive healing from our shame. So I challenge you today, when social media images make you feel unattractive and unlovable, when you are exhausted beyond all measure, when you think your life has gone so wrong that there is no coming back from it, when medical worries loom large, when your life just isn't what you expected or wanted it to be, reach out and touch the hem of his garment. He might not fix everything, but one thing he will not do is leave you unchanged.